Oh boy. So if you haven't seen it, there's a trend that went around on YouTube called childhood trauma. Basically, the creator would talk about media or events that happened to him as a kid, specifically ones that weren't necessarily supposed to be scary, that stuck with him into adulthood. Watching every single one of these videos, there were absolutely none that I could relate to. Every single thing that scared me as a kid, no one else talked about. So either no one knows about this stuff, or I'm just really dumb. Either way, I wanted to make a video about it. The way you're supposed to do this is someone's supposed to challenge you to do the video. Uh, did anyone challenge me? No. Does anyone care that I'm making this? Probably not. I have the list broken down. So first we're gonna talk about movies and TV shows going in rescinding order. So from oldest to youngest, because as I get smaller, uh, these progressively get stupider. And then finally, we're gonna talk about video games because I think I found the thing that is the root of the reason that I am the way that I am. Also, I'll get more sappy about this at the end of the video, but I'm at 10k subs and it really does mean the most from you all. I'll talk about more at the end, but sincerely, thank you guys, it means a lot. So let's go ahead and get into this, and as always, thank you for watching. To call a cutoff somewhere on this, I said 10 years old back counts as childhood trauma. And the only thing I can remember that really freaked me out at 10 years old was the Zack Snyder movie 300. Now I know what you might be thinking, yeah it's got blood and gore and violence and all that, but I really didn't care about that as a kid. As a matter of fact, it was tradition for me and my dad to watch movies that I definitely shouldn't have been watching at the time. So none of that bothered me. But there was one particular scene that did get to me a bit. If you're not familiar with the movie, there are these random scenes and shots of this old world mysticism stuff. Like guys with crab hands and giant monster orc looking people. However, when I was a kid, the one thing that my dad would always fast forward whenever we came to in a movie was people kithing. Now, it's totally fine if they're cutting each other's heads off or attacking people with chainsaws, but kith? No, no. So there is a scene in the movie 300 when the hunchback is confronted by Xerxes when he offers to give him the kingdom in exchange for betrayal of the Spartans. And there's a lot of kithing that commences in that scene so my dad goes to fast forward but right before he does there's this shot now i had no context for it i knew dad was fast forwarding so it wasn't something that i was supposed to ask about so i didn't but it bothered me for so long afterwards what was that because like the other surrealist stuff in the movie it's never mentioned or at least if it was mentioned, we skipped the scene that would have been mentioned in. So as a kid, I had no idea why this satanic creature was just there on screen in the middle of a war movie. Now looking back on it, I think it's pretty cool, and it shows like the duality of both sides, one family given to tradition, and one family given to sinful lust, and so much so that they literally have a goat head on their side. So while I can appreciate it now, as a kid, it really stuck with me. This next one I'm gonna be short on because if you've seen my lighthouse video, link in the description. I go more into detail on it. However, there was this really cheesy movie that once again my dad had me watching, uh, when I probably shouldn't have, called Hallowed Grounds. It was about your stereotypical scarecrow that runs around murdering people. However, the convention that happened is in the movie a character would say, I'll be back in 20 minutes, and then they'd leave and die, and then the scarecrow would show up to chase the main character. Well, when we watched this, it was the middle of the day, and dad and I were in a hotel room, so I wasn't scared at all. But then when the movie's over, he goes to get takeout, and he looks at me and says, I'll be back in 20 minutes and leaves. And I was like, ha ha, ha ha, ha. That was one of my first brushes with like psychological horror. And again, in the Lighthouse video, I talked more about how that kind of expounded into the horror that I'm interested in now. But in that hang time when he wasn't in the room, I legitimately thought a scarecrow was gonna like jump through the window and get me. Also in my defense, I was eight. Speaking of, another movie that we watched in a hotel room that had me freaked out was The Deep Blue Sea. Now. We're gonna talk about the ocean here in a minute, but this is our first introduction to it. For context, I am horrified of the ocean. That is the one thing to this day that I hate, that I don't wanna deal with, that I have nothing to do with, and I just, like, I played Subnautica all the way through, so whenever I got to a point where you have to, like, drop off a reef and go straight down, I would just close my eyes and then peek through my fingers and then just, like, check the depth to see if I was there. Then when I got to the bottom of the ocean, I would just like nosedive into the ground so I didn't have to look around. 
Yeah. One of the first movies that I saw that had to do with the ocean was Deep Blue Sea. So the scene that scared me in it is one that probably not a lot of people will remember. There is a scene where the super shark is attacking LL Cool J. I was a child. And LL Cool J goes and hides in the oven for some reason, to which the shark is attacking him. Now, I've got another really bad, or had a really bad fear of being trapped or like bound up and unable to move. So as soon as this guy is trapped in an oven and there's a shark getting in, I close my eyes because the thought of someone trapped in an oven while a shark's attacking uh, was a lot. And then while it's happening, I remember like holding my hands like this and thinking to myself, I really hope the oven doesn't turn on. And about the same time, my dad screams in excitement, the shark turned the oven on. So I sat there thinking about what it would be like to be boiled alive and drowning with the shark trying to get into an oven. I don't think I watched the rest of the movie. Actually, to this day, I don't think I watched the rest of the movie. I mean, now it's like, whatever, cool. I really love horror and stuff like that. But again, as a kid, man, that was some wild stuff. Another movie genre that I really hated was post-apocalyptic movies. Now you see, I was raised in the South, right? So as a kid, any enemy that you could like shoot and kill, I wasn't afraid of. Like I watched Friday the 13th and Halloween and all that, and the entire time I'm like, why don't they just shoot them with, <laughs> okay, okay, it wasn't that bad. I was like, why don't, why don't they just shoot them with a gun? Like th this movie could be two minutes. So like people or monsters never bothered me. Aliens was one of my favorite movies as a kid because like it was cool to watch people blast them away. So the things that did scare me was things you couldn't necessarily fight. So like I just mentioned drowning inside of an oven, like what are you gonna do, shoot the oven? Post-apocalyptic movies were the exact same thing in the vein of like 2012 and Armageddon. I specifically remember the old movie Deep Impact really getting to me. More so because a lot of the horror in that movie was about the futility of the situation. Like I remember that there was a woman who was on the top floor of a skyscraper and whenever someone asked, what are you doing? She was like, maybe we'll be okay up here. And I remember as a small child watching, be like, no, you won't, you won't be okay. That won't help anything. You can't help. And then there's two characters who like go and just stand there and hug each other and wait for the comet to come kill them. And realizing like that you can't do anything to fight it and you can't run, uh, that really messed with me. And I hated it so much. All right, so now we're getting into the like, the heavy stuff everything i mentioned before is like oh that was kind of creepy this is the start of like things that kept me up at night the real childhood trauma and probably the one defining series that i can say was supposed to scare me and really did was animal planet's lost tapes now if you don't remember lost tapes uh for one i'm sorry because it was awesome but essentially what it was at like one and two in the morning at night on animal planet they would air these found footage mockumentaries every episode was centered around a different cryptid that was hunting down whatever the camera crew was i remember as a kid some of them were awesome like there was the zombie episode that i thought was really cool but some of them really got under my skin. The ones that come to mind off the top of my head, there was the one about the cave sirens that attacked a group of soldiers. And I remember at the end, the soldier's dead and we just see his body cam and all we see is a beak pecking at him. I didn't care for that at all. There was a werewolf episode where they kept showing this thing over and over. Also, I would have been like eight years old by myself at two in the morning. So like, give me some slack. And then funny enough, there was an episode on the Wendigo in which I was legitimately terrified of the Wendigo. Oh, how far we've come but without a doubt The one that ruined me more than anything else Was the Strigo episode now for those who don't know a Strigo is a demonic vampire and the show always does this thing where they'll cut away mid clip and explain stuff to you so like the Strigo is also a shapeshifter so they cut away and then they have an expert explain like, oh, well, Strigos can take the form of animals sometimes in order to stalk humans. And then we cut back to the mockumentary and a dog runs by. And as a kid, I'm like, oh, oh I bet that's connected. And the tension keeps ramping up. So before the scene that destroyed me, they explained that the protocol for whenever a priest would kill a Strigo was to place it in a coffin, sever the neck, coat it in garlic and iron, and flip it upside down so that if it does wake up, 
it will dig its way back to hell. So I'm sitting there like, oh, I bet this thing looks awful. And then there is a scene where they've got the person they think is a Strigo in a chair, and this happens. Now, looking back on it now, uh, it's pretty tame, like nothing. But you'd be like a seven-year-old kid at two in the morning in a quiet house. I, I remember I shut it off. I curled up on the couch and probably cried. <laughs> like, I would watch Lost Tapes regularly as a kid. Like, I would watch an episode and then get scared and then a couple days later watch another episode. But after that, I don't think I ever watched the show again. Because I was so afraid that it would pop back up. I also think this was kind of formative in me getting into like creepy pastas because like once I became a teenager and like sought out scary faces and stuff that messed with me, I was kind of looking for that high again. And I remember like Jeff the Killer was it for a while and stuff like that. And then I eventually got into SCPs off of that. So I'm kind of glad this happened if it put me where I'm at now, but nothing ever hit as hard as being a small child on the couch and seeing that face. Also off of Lost Tapes, just a quick side note, there was one episode about the Thunderbird, which if you don't know is this American native legend of these giant birds that will swoop down and pick people up. And I don't remember even seeing the episode, but just hearing the concept about it, there would be nights where we would be driving home at night and I would look up through the sunroof of the car and think, huh, that thing could just come and ripped the roof right off couldn't it that's cool all right so now we're transitioning into like a little little kid stuff everyone has an episode of goosebumps that set them off everyone like my age it, it's part of like our religion for a lot of people it's the night of the living dummy uh for some it's dead house but no one has mentioned the one that stuck with me forever and honestly was probably part of the reason that the Strigo messed with me as much as it did. That is the episode Cry of the Cat. Now, I don't remember a lot about the plot specifics of the episode, but I know that this girl had a cat that for some reason, whenever it scratched someone, it would eventually turn them into a cat. So I was like, oh, fine, cute, Goosebumps episode, whatever, who cares? Uh, and then near the end of the episode, someone's mom was mid-transformation and she looked like this. That was awful. What is that? <laughs> like watching the Strigo one now, I'm like, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought it is. But going back and looking at the Goosebumps, I'm like, no, I was right. Like, why did they show this to children? She wasn't like evil or anything. Like she still had her sense about her, which honestly probably made it worse because she was conscious while she was in that state, which again, in that Lighthouse episode, I talked about why the thing scared me so much. And honestly, thinking about it, this kind of body horror is probably what led me into liking that so much. All right, I said as I get younger, these get more ridiculous and I wasn't lying. So back to Animal Planet. You may remember the TV show The Most Extreme, and if you don't, once again, you were missing out. The Most Extreme was a countdown series before countdowns were cool that showcased different animals in the animal kingdom. So for example, one episode could have been like the top 10 jumpers, and it was a countdown of like relative to their size, what animal or insect can jump the highest so you can think about that with resilience i remember there's a top 10 urban legends about animals and stuff like that that got me interested in animals and history as a kid see what they would do is whenever they talked about these sort of abstract concepts with animals they would tie it into history somehow and i thought that was awesome like for example if they were talking about chameleons and how they changed their skin tone they would have a cutaway in which they talked about disguises that armies employed throughout human history it was a really cool back and forth and i loved it every time except one i can't even remember what the animal was that they were talking about or insect but whatever it was, it burrowed itself underground to remain like that for a while. Probably cicadas or something similar. However, the cutaway they decided to use for whatever this topic was, was about people being buried alive. Now, I was like six, maybe five. I had never even considered that a possibility at the time. I'm like, buried alive? 
I just figured out what buried was. But then sure enough, they tell this story about a girl who I think was in the Carolinas. And I remember details like that because it messed with me so much. They described a young girl who was buried in a mausoleum who a year later, her brother died. So they go to put her brother in the mausoleum. And when they open up the door, her skeleton was lying on the floor, meaning she was able to escape the coffin, but couldn't get out of the mausoleum and no one hurt her. That was a lot to take in. So me being the dumb kid that I was, decided to like seek this stuff out because you know, you have DVR and you type in Buried Alive. It's like, oh look, there's a History Channel documentary at three in the morning I can watch. So I record it and then I watch it and it didn't make matters any better. I would have these vivid nightmares as a kid of like being buried alive or like being in a coffin and no one could hear me. And it's because I would like worry myself sick over it to the point that I would have like nightmares about it. It was not fun. I'm literally halfway through this list. I was a wuss. <laughs> Something that I've never liked in any regard is like broken and stilted movements. Like now I think it's cool and an interesting horror concept, but as a kid, I did not care for that at all. And when compiling this list, I went back and tried to find stuff that like related to it. The closest I could get was this really old claymation movie called Mouse Soup. I remember the plot, it was about like, a mouse telling like a weasel, I think it was a weasel, like telling a weasel stories about like what happened to him or whatever, I forget. But something about the way the weasel moved, especially when it was chasing the mouse, was like too fast for the way it was moving. It's not the way it's supposed to end. He's supposed to catch the measly mouse. That was close. And like now I understand it's because of the uncanny valley. Like if things don't move the way that they're supposed to move, it kind of like trips something in my dumb caveman brain. But it just leads you to ask like, well, if we're inherently afraid of that, then what did humans experience in our past that makes that a constant? That we are afraid of things that are almost human, but not quite human. Why do we all have that same fear? What happened to us? I asked my parents about this list before I did it uh, to see if they knew anything. And mom said I was really afraid of Disneyland mascots whenever I went. Uh, and it was probably due to this because it all ties back into that things aren't moving or acting the way they're supposed to be. All right, we are down to the final movie slash TV show on here. And I told you it was gonna get dumber. So when I was four years old, I was terrified. <laughs> of Thomas and the Tank Engine's Diesel the Claw. I got a plan and you're not in it. Losing your sparkle, huh? What perfect timing. Now where is that loss not clever enough to stop me? I don't remember what the name of this movie was. It was something about a magical island or railroad. I know that Alec Baldwin was in it, but there was a bad guy in this movie called Diesel who chased the other like trains around and there was some urban legend they told about him on like a misty moonlit night. And he had this big like extendable claw that he would chase the other trains with. And I specifically remember there was a scene on a bridge in which it was probably Alec Baldwin, I don't know. But uh, one character was picked up by the claw and he was threatening to like crush him to death. And then like he's got to find a quick way out and he like cuts the fuel line to his claw or whatever and then falls and like being four that was a lot to take in that's like the furthest back thing i can remember that like truly scared me as a kid in media all right so now we're getting into video games as a kid i played a lot of video games i had the playstation one i got the playstation two like the day it came out so we're going to follow the same formula going backwards so as a kid i really liked the jack and dexter video game a uh, legend of the precursor precursor stone whatever the one was we're like you gotta go find these little orb egg things i can't remember like i wasn't into series because i didn't know enough at the time i would just like pick a random game and be like this is fun i'm gonna play it for hours so at least in the first chapter of the game is set on an island surrounded by like open ocean and there we go to that ocean again. We're gonna get to the root of that in a bit. And the game was pretty fun. It was like a platformer type, but I remember playing it and thinking, I wonder what would happen if I just swam out. <laughs> oh boy. So like 
there were these islands way off in the distance. I'm like, oh, I bet I could get to them. So I like hop in the ocean and I start swimming. And then like I'm going and then all of a sudden there's a heartbeat sound that starts playing and it starts out like bum 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 and then it goes bum 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 and I was like whoa 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 what's going on and then all of a sudden <laughs> and uh yeah I didn't I didn't swim out to the ocean again I think I was afraid of the rest of the game because I thought that fish would show up but no it's entirely just an out-of-bounds penalty <laughs> this was the root of the reason that I am so afraid of Subnautica <laughs> I like I've never swam out in another game since like yeah I've played games that like ocean horrors involved but for one I'm not happy about it and uh, in games that you're not supposed to be in the ocean I just don't go in the ocean like a lot of people when they played Far Cry 3 immediately swam out I was like nah I'm, I'm good, I don't need to know what's out there, it's fine. I think related to the ocean is this like overarching fear I have of like the unknown and like the infinite. So uh, like in the lighthouse, it was described better than I ever have heard it before, the infinite waters, and that's absolutely true. For that same reason, I get kind of this sense of like megaphobia, which is the fear of like giant things that like dwarf you as a person whenever i would think too long about like space and the cosmos now i think it's pretty cool and i think space is cool and like science behind it and all that and i think that the reason i think it's so cool now is because as a kid it really did kind of creep me out if you can't tell this is all because i thought of stuff too much and would like think about it to the point that it got scary. There's probably like no one who remembers these, but as a kid on the PlayStation 2, there was this thing called the Jam Pack series. So Jam Pack was demo discs that would come out like every season. So it was one level from like 10 different video games so that you could figure out and play it. Again, I was a dumb kid and didn't get that. I'm just like, oh cool, I'll just play this demo over and over and over. And then one of the Jam Packs, I can't remember which one it was, had a Star Wars Squadron game in it. So it's like aerial combat, like ace combat, but set in space. And I remember either the sky or space, I would just like tilt my plane up and start flying and just keep going. I'm like, wow, this sure is a lot of nothingness. I got over it, but that was weird enough to mention. Also, I had to search it, but for the Jam Pack Summer 01, the main menu screen is like a spaceship in the middle of space and I remember flipping through like the menus and just seeing like infinite nothingness in the background and being like, who boy. <laughs> like in that same demo pack was a video game ICO which I think was supposed to be like a horror series uh, and that kind of scared me but not near as much as like the menu the thought because i'm okay with monsters and creepy stuff unless it's the strigo but when it came to like thought concepts about infinity and like the nothingness of humanity nope get it out of here another game that i really loved as a kid was war of the monsters looking back on it this game was awesome like i don't know why this hasn't been remastered or someone made some unreal engine project for it because this was so fun i think it's just because no one knows about it so this was a multiplayer fighting game where there was also like a single player campaign where the whole setup was it was these old 50s movie monsters so like godzilla king kong these giant electricity monsters giant insects although you know there wasn't branded names, but you get the point. And you would be set in like these metropolitan areas and fight each other and you could like throw each other through buildings and pick up like these radio antennas and throw them at each other. And all of the menu screens were like old 50s horror movie posters. Even looking back on it now, the main menu selection screen was an old drive-in movie theater, setting up the idea that everything that we're watching is like inside of a cinematic universe. And it was like really, really fun. I wish someone would do more with this. Like my cousin would come over and we would play it all the time and it was great. However, uh, this is where the one scare comes in. Also, and once again prefacing i was six so none of the game bothered me like i said violence blood gore whatever who cares the way that it worked is you could fight in the campaign mode as whatever character you select 
And once you got to the end of the campaign and completed it, you unlocked a cutscene for that character. So for example, for the giant like Japanese Ultron looking robot, it showed how he was created. For the giant electricity man, it showed how he was created. And there was like this thin sort of overreaching plot that it was all because of an alien invasion that transformed these creatures to exist. But the one that got me was for the praying mantis. See, I really love this game, so I went through and did the origins for every single character. I remember one of them had a guy falling in a volcano and that didn't bother me. But in the praying mantis one, the doctor has a completely normal sized praying mantis. And then he adds what I assume was like the alien reactant stuff to it. And it grows to this giant size and then eats him. <laughs> And I remember just sitting there being like, that was horrible. <laughs> Cause then I started thinking about like the logistics of being torn to pieces like that. Also as a kid, like I would catch praying mantis. Cause I wasn't like, let me preface this. I wasn't just a nerd. Like I was still a dumb boy who like ran outside and like poked bugs with sticks. So at that time, like I would catch praying mantises and keep them in a jar and like feed them stuff and watch them eat. Cause you know, cool gross boy stuff. And like, Watching that scene, like I remember looking at whatever praying mantis I caught next and being like, if you were bigger, I'd be dead. And then we get back to that whole like existential problems of it and like how vicious things in the world interact. And so this was another tipping point. However, now I think monster movies are awesome. <laughs> like movies with giant praying mantises and spiders eating people are cool and it's savage and gross and brutal and I still love it. But I remember like being six and watching that cutscene and just like being mortified by it, but almost in a good way. Cause that was the only campaign that I replayed through before I realized there was a menu that you can just go back and watch cutscenes that I replayed all the way through just to watch that cutscene again. Cause I liked that it freaked me out. I was weird. All right. And here we are at the one. This was an event that was so traumatic to little me that I think it was responsible for my fear of the ocean itself and therefore my fear of existential nothingness altogether. And that was Jet Moto for the PlayStation 1. Now hold on. I think it was Jet Moto. I don't have the original disc, but after watching videos of gameplay, I'm pretty sure that's what it was because it looks similar and I always picked the red and green jet ski. So Jet Moto was your standard fare jet ski game you know bad graphics playstation one where you just drive around and drive through time trials or whatever i enjoyed it enough however i haven't been able to find footage of this so i don't know if it was like one specific course that i did or if it was a glitch or what but here's what happened i want to set the mood too i would have been about five at the time i'm sitting there past my bedtime so everyone else in the house has to go to bed i've been told like five times to go to sleep and i'm like yeah okay but i'm setting up with a blanket over my head playing my jet ski game i'm playing everything's fine and then either for a glitch or i went off the track in an event i have not seen recreated online yet i started driving out into open ocean and see i remember thinking at first like well where's the course where am i supposed to go and I just kept going into nothingness. And then there was something about the textures of the water just lapping and repeating themselves over the over. And I was looking out at nothing and continuously going into it. And I just sat there pushing forward and thinking like, when does this end? And then all of a sudden, a texture loaded in of the wall. So all at once, I went from straight out blankness to bomb now this was like little pin cushion everything's okay me so i didn't think about this unexpected thing happening all of a sudden and me having to deal with it after like looking inwards to figure out why i'm still pushing forward i can single-handedly tie this in as the reason that i am both afraid of the ocean and giant objects if anyone can like find footage of this or anything similar like 
please let me know. I don't know that it was Jet Moto. I know I played Jet Moto. If there's like another jet ski or boat game for the PlayStation 1 that this was possible in, pl please let me know because I need to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. Like that got to me so much that when I got the PlayStation 2 and played the jet ski game X2O, I remember driving over like the murky water and being like, there's gonna be something up here. There's gonna be something big pop up. And that game was like all on rivers and lakes, but still I was, I was waiting for it. <laughs> you know, you know what? I just remembered setting here that not long after I was playing a Bass Pro Shop fishing game and the way it worked was when you threw your lure in the water, you transitioned to underwater to watch it swim towards you. And I, I distinctly remember I was like fishing next to a dam so the water's really deep and I couldn't see anything and I'm cranking like my little bait in. Then all of a sudden from the camera came this giant catfish. <laughs> And I was like, ah, there it is. There, there's the rock from the jet ski game. Cause it was that same feeling that happened again. And like all the other fears I talked about, like I got over like the lost tape stuff, like, oh, scary face or like being trapped and buried alive. I'm like, yeah, it's not really plausible. And if it is, I mean, whatever. But like that one, I'm still to this day, like giant things underwater and the open infinite water itself. No, dude, count me out. This has been quite therapeutic for me. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Like I said at the beginning, I've just hit 10,000 subscribers, which like, so like, for those that don't know, I had a, like another page on Instagram that got shut down at 17,000. Uh, and I just remember being really bummed about it and just like, well, I guess, I guess that's it. I guess it's not up from here. And now I'm like doing something I really want to be doing. And I'm at 10,000, something I never thought would be possible. And it, it was so fast too. And it's all because of you guys and like making the videos do great and commenting and all of that. It's, it really does mean the most. And I, I, to appreciate it's an understatement. I, I'm blessed to have you guys and it really does mean the most. So as always, thank you for watching. I want to say thank you uh, to everyone who's watching as always. A special thank you to my subscribers. A massive thank you to my patrons and a very, very massive thank you to my top tier patrons. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Pef. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Publius. Thank you, Saucy. Thank you, Neoclassical Succubus. Thank you, Steven. Thank you, Mari. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Come Ranger. Thank you, Xavier. And thank you, Alvaro. Uh, it really does mean the most. And just the fact that people would like donate to this because they enjoy it is mind-blowing to me and i really couldn't do it without you guys thank you next iceberg video and the main iceberg coming up soon so look forward to that and as always thank you for watching and i will see you all in the next one bye